It's a great pleasure to be here as uh, the guest of Aberdeen Young Professionals to speak about the oil and gas industry, which uh, in Scotland uh, is, I think, uh, the best in the world. And I wanted to talk about why I believe that that's the case and uh, also uh, make some suggestions about how we continue to ensure that that is the case in the future. And I also am very keen to, to hear your views uh, because I haven't had this opportunity from such a young audience to hear what your perspectives are, so I hope we can do that in the discussion section. Um, my own background is as a solicitor, uh, and uh, having run my own business for 17 years, um, I uh, have that experience to, to come to government, but uh, when I became the energy minister, um, I didn't know a huge amount about the oil and gas industry, so I thought I'd better put that right. So. In the last uh, three years, I have visited uh, well over 100 companies, most of which are in Aberdeen, uh, as well as uh, visiting many companies abroad in Houston at OTC a couple of times, in uh, Oslo, in Canada. And I've spent a lot of time working very closely with, with Alix, with Malcolm Webb at uh, Oil & Gas UK, uh, with Opito, uh, with Morven, with John McDonald, uh, with uh, the Offshore Contractors Association, with Subsea UK, with the Drilling Contractors Association, and uh, trying to get to know and to understand what the oil and ga gas industry is about. Um, I think what we get out in life is very much directly related to the amount of effort we put in. The more work we do, the more our understanding is, the greater uh, our ability to help. When I became the Minister for um, Energy, Enterprise and Tourism, um, I rapidly came to the conclusion that we needed to try to do a number of things for the oil and gas sector. First and foremost was to present the right impression of the industry as an industry which has an amazing and long future, not an industry which is coming to a close, which is about to finish. And there were too many people, uh, certainly out with Aberdeen, who had that false impression about the oil and gas industry. They, they thought, oh, it's over. You know, the oil and gas, it's all finished. It's gone. Now, maybe they thought that because they've been advised of that by some people over many years. Um, and that's wrong. Because what I rapidly realized in speaking with industry leaders was that the opposite is the truth. You will know here from the work that many of you do, and I, I see that we, we have here a wide variety of companies represented, and many of your companies are involved in the projects which are, are taking place now or which are about to take place. Uh, projects such as the BP Clarefield or Statoil's Mariner Field or Enquest's Kraken Field or uh, Apache. I think, Ross, are you here from Apache? Uh, Apache has transformed expectations because they, of course, purchased the uh, 40s field. And at the time they purchased it, there were only supposed to be so many barrels left in total. Well, they've already got all that out and they haven't finished yet, have they? How did they do that? Because they transformed and took to a new stage the use of technology to, ex to uh, maximize production. The use of reservoir management and seismic analysis enabled them to do what hadn't been done before. They had more hunger, didn't they? More appetite. They were smaller, they were more flexible, and they would have been more successful as a result. Uh, and their extraction rate, the production rate, I think is, uh, uh, as an example, I think to many others in the industry, and production costs are probably one of the biggest problems facing the industry now. So when I became the minister, I rapidly realized this is a great industry. It's not a dying one. It's one that's moving towards a second life. Now, the first life we, we know about, and I've kind of lived through, and, and I guess uh, you were doing what I do these days quite a lot, watching programs like CBeebies, you know, when it was first started. I, I now have to watch that because my daughter is five, so I don't get to watch much grown-up TV, as she puts it. Um, but back uh, in the days when you were watching that, well, the industry was just getting started, wasn't it? Uh, and over those four decades... What has happened is that Aberdeen has achieved a degree of eminence in the industry precisely because the people in Aberdeen have been doing it for these last decades, have built up experience, especially in subsea, but also in many other areas of expertise. And they're now quite simply the best at it in the world. 
Uh, I'm meeting um, Rod Christie of GE again tomorrow. The first time I met him, 18 months ago, he explained why he, in GE, is designing the trees for the Gorgon Field off West Australia uh, in Aberdeen and Montrose. And he said, quite simply, Fergus, the reason that GE is based in Aberdeen and now Montrose as well, the reason why we're designing these trees, incidentally, the most modern gas trees, I think, in the world, uh, so he tells me anyway, uh, maybe some would, would differ with that, the reason is we, my people working for us, are the best people in the world at this. Uh, and maybe a failing of us in Scotland is we're not very keen on boasting like that, you know. We don't like doing that too much. But nonetheless, I quickly discovered that it's true that we have this expertise. And it's expertise that exists amongst a, not a small number of people, not a handful of people, but tens of thousands of people, many of them based in Aberdeen and many more of them working throughout the world. Another thing I learned very quickly about the industry is that... Uh, uh, it is now not just an industry that's extracting oil from the North Sea and west of Shetland, it's also increasingly, and particularly over the last 10 years, being a worldwide industry. This, Aberdeen, this is not just the oil capital of Europe, but it is the place from which international exploration, appraisal, drilling, extraction is organized from and arranged from. The figures are that about 10 years ago, the amount of... Uh, income, the sort of GVA of the industry, attributable to non-UK waters, i.e. attributable to international work, was 34% of the total. In 2011, that had risen to 47%, namely nearly half of all the money made from oil and gas was attributable to work done not in the North Sea and not in West of Shetland, but all over the world. 47%, nearly half in 2011, or 8,000 million pounds. Uh, and I know because I meet a great many people who work all over the world, who are spending a lot of time on a plane, but traveling, traveling to Brazil, to Africa, to Canada, to the USA, to Australia, to Indonesia, all over the world, wherever there's oil. If you go down the main street in uh, any city in Kazakhstan or Azerbaijan or Brazil, Bacaye, it will probably take you about two minutes before you hear an Aberdonian accent, whether you want to or not. People from Aberdeen are leading the industry all over the world, and they're doing it because they built up that knowledge. And that's a great thing, and I think it's a great thing, if I may say so, for people of your generation, because you're in a very, very fortunate position, which these guys weren't, that you can use their knowledge. You can and you should use their knowledge and exploit that knowledge and experience for your gain. And you know something? What I've learned is that there's nobody more approachable or helpful than people in the oil and gas industry. There's no snobbery like you might get. I better not name them because I don't want anybody to tweet things like this. But there are other industries, some of them connected perhaps with London and finance, where <laughs> you know, I might get myself into trouble here, where you know, there's a sense of what school did you go to, who was your daddy, how much money have you got, that doesn't matter in the oil and gas industry, what matters is results. It's what you do. And I've never found a group of people in industry that are more willing and keen to help others learn to achieve great success and to pass on knowledge and experience. We have a group of people called Global Scots uh, who work all around the world and they're so lame and they, get, well, they don't get paid for it. They wouldn't want, they, in fact, they would want not to be paid for this. And I'll be meeting some of them in OTC in Houston Again, Derek Blackwood of the Wood Group, uh, head of the Wood Group in the Americas. Uh, he went to America for three months and he's, in 1998 and he's still there. And he spends, as do all these global Scots, at the top of the industry in, many, in all areas, all his, much of his time helping young Scottish people succeed. Open the right doors. Meet the right people. Avoid making the mistakes that others have learned by experience. Uh, so at this stage in the industry, the second life of the industry, the second 40 years, you have got that terrific advantage, I think, of learning from others. Uh, and what does the future hold? Well, you know, the statistics, uh, I think, are, are fairly, fairly positive. There are 24 billion barrels of oil left, according to estimates of Oil and Gas UK. Some say more, some say slightly less. 
it's a hell of a lot of oil and gas. There's 200,000 people in Scotland that work in the industry. There's 450,000 jobs supported in the UK by the industry. There's 2,000 companies in Scotland operating in 100 countries throughout the world. Uh, and it is without doubt the most important industry economically for Scotland, although we have many, many other great and very strong industries. The opportunities in the industry are immense. And I think one of the, one of the sad things for me, and this is not meant to be a political comment, because I'm really not that interested in, in, in kind of politics as, as we think about it, uh, is that because there has been a negative view about the industry, you know, it's dying out, it's all gone. I fear that some of your contemporaries may have thought, hmm, not for me, I don't want to go into a dying industry because there ain't a future there. I think it's less so in Aberdeen, but in other parts of Scotland, you know, parents may speak to their children and say, well, you know, we've heard the oil's running out. I don't think you, it's not a safe thing to do to go in, into an industry for a career for your lifetime if it's running out. So my aim in part is to clear all that away, tell the truth, the opposite, which is there's an immensely positive series of opportunities. Um, and there's lots and lots of things that we can talk about tonight about how we encourage young people into the industry. And I'm very keen to hear, actually, your views, because, frankly, they're probably of more relevance than, than mine. Um, although my five-year-old daughter at the moment doesn't want to go into the oil and gas industry, she wants to be a ballerina in the morning and a princess in the afternoon. <laughs> so I better start earning rather more money than the <laughs> politicians do to support that. Um, but, you know, one of my favorite quotes is um, from the Irish poet William Butler Yeats. And he said something that as soon as I read it, I thought, uh, and this doesn't happen very often in life, but I read it, I thought, gosh, that sums it all up. What is education for? What do we want education to be about and achieve? And, and his quote was, education should not be about filling a bucket. It should be about lighting a fire. And by that, I think he meant that what we want to try to do, I think what we want to try to do, is to inspire people of perhaps five, ten years younger than yourself to think about, to start thinking about, yes, this might be for me. How do we get that to happen? Let me tell you one thing we're doing, uh, and working with Opito to do this, and with uh, Oil & Gas UK and many others in the room, and Gordon McGuinness is, is here, the gentleman over there, uh, from Skills Development in Scotland because he cares very much about helping young people and he's very senior in Skills Development Scotland. So um, one of the things we're going to do in May and June, and we're starting this with three events, uh, and this is my idea, so it bloody well better work, Gordon, okay? Uh, how do we inspire young, chil young children? Well, they don't really want to hear from me. I'm too old. They want to hear from you, your contemporaries, in the industry about what you do. You are their role models. Children that from perhaps 12 to 16 don't know what to do. I mean, how can somebody who's 12 know what uh, a seismologist does or a project manager does? Not a clue, I mean, why should they know? It's our duty to tell them, to tell children what are the opportunities in life. So we decided that we're going to have three pilot events uh, in a uh, bringing together, in each case, groups of secondary schools, five or six at a time, several hundred children, and hold a substantial event where they have all the children can hear from people your age uh, a description of what you do, whether it be a project manager or a seismic analyst uh, or an underwater diver. Uh, I suppose you don't get any other types, do you? Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, the aim is to have a clear explanation to children. These are some of the opportunities there are in the oil and gas industry. Uh, they might be interested. No, as I learned, for example, when I visited the underwater diving center in Fort William and spoke to Steve Hamm, that actually, if you're a, a busy diver and you can earn 1,500 quid a day, then you can earn twice as much as the prime minister. Now, I know that you probably deserve to earn three or four times as much, but... Uh, uh, but we need to open the horizons of young people to the opportunities and how better than to get in the room, 
have displays and demonstrations, stalls, exhibits, which Opito are, I think, helping to organize, but have a array of inspiring speakers, your peers. If you would like to do this, incidentally, if you'd like to be part of this or future events, please tell me or Gordon afterwards, because you know I think you are the people who can inspire uh, those who are 5, 10, 15 years, in some cases, looking around at some of the grey heads, uh, those who might be persuaded to come into the industry. Um, what I also think the oil and gas industry needs is, is a bit of, uh, frankly, a bit of stability in the tax side. This is absolutely essential. I know of no industry in the world that can, where you can expect companies to invest five to ten billion dollars in a project unless you know that the deal you have at the start is a deal you can rely on for the lifetime of the project. Now, as a lawyer, that seems to me to be self-evident. A contract should be a contract. Uh, I think there are some other lawyers here from Brodie's, if I'm not mistaken, from the audience list. A contract is a contract. It is beyond me how it can be defensible, justifiable right or anything other than inimical to the success of the industry if there's chopping and changing in the tax regime and if after having made massive investments, investors then find that the basis upon which that investment was made has changed, the goalposts have moved, the tax rates are hiked, bareboat charters come along, bareboat charter taxes come along, and the basis upon which the investment was made has changed. That seems to me to be wrong. Irrespective of whether we have the UK or Scotland independent, uh, it's essential that the instability, the chopping and changing, the unexpected, unpredictable tax hikes are introduced. Uh, and I do fear that uh, you know, the, the, this, this problem may, in the, in the next 12 months, cause some difficulties in the sector because I think uh, you know, there are very serious difficulties facing the sector, primarily because of rising costs over the past uh, few years. But having said that, that's not really the, uh, uh, not, not really the focus for tonight. Uh, and therefore, I think tonight, what I hope we can do is perhaps have a discussion and a debate about how we achieve that uh, sea change. And that's what we need in the attitude towards the oil and gas industry amongst young people in Scotland and how by doing that, working together as a country, we can ensure that as we are the best in the world now, we remain the best in the world for the next decades ahead in all the many, many aspects of this uh, great industry. And in turn, in 30 or 40 years time, you will be passing on your knowledge ex and experience as the leaders of this industry to your children and their friends, and thereby seeing Scotland retaining its reputation and its role in the world for honesty, hard work, thrift, determination, drive, success, honesty, achievement, and reward. So thank you very much indeed for listening to me.